Well, it's really great to be back with uh, you. Uh, you probably remember last summer. Uh, yeah, I preached from Daniel 1. So I'm picking up where I left off. <laughs> Daniel 2. Uh, this week, we're going to go through Daniel 2, 1 through 23. And then next week, Daniel 2, 24 through 49. And I can't wait because uh, at this rate, I'll finish Daniel uh, by 2027. So stay with me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Now, some of you may ask, uh, if you're new, like, why Daniel? God gave Daniel, had him write the book, and gave it to us for his people living in exile, just as Daniel was. Daniel was living as a, as a believer of Jesus Christ in a foreign land, Babylon, in Babylon. And uh, God gave him many revelations to pass down to his people, us, when we live in a culture that is also, you might say, antagonistic to the faith, and we live in uncertain and troublous times. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. If you have a pew Bible, it's on page 875. Page 875. Daniel 2, and I'm going to read from 1 through 23. Let us listen now to the word of the living God. <clears throat> In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, that is astro astrologers, be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dreams, and we'll show its interpretation. And the king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there's but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is too difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with man. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill him. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. 
and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. And so ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. O most glorious Father, his very hand measures the universe. Stretch forth your hand this hour and draw our hearts closer to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the fount of all wisdom and power. Amen. Amen. The main point is very simple. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Right? That's how we began our worship service. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And Daniel 2, 1 through 23, uh, I think can be easily structured along three simple questions. First, who are the wise men of this world? Who are the wise men of this world? He's seeking to answer that. Secondly, what are the marks of a wise man? What are the marks of a wise man? And then thirdly, who is a wise man's God? Who is the wise man's God? So let's take each in turn. The first question, where are the wise of this world? The answer in verses 1 through 13 is nowhere. Nowhere. Remember, it all began with a dream, a dream that God gave, a dream that troubled Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled. Again, verse 3, I have had a dream and my spirit is troubled. Now, you and I may not put a lot of stock in dreams, but the ancient world did. For they thought dreams were a window to the future and to their fate. And if you could somehow understand the future, what will happen, you could take action in the present to protect yourself and your loved ones from the fearsome forces that the future will bring. So it's in great fear that Nebuchadnezzar summons his wise men. Look at verse 2. Magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, or as I said, astrologers, dream interpreters. Now, that may be odd to us, but is it really? Don't we modern people also have our wise men? We call them think tanks. We call them university professors, right? And we do so in the hope that we believe they can sift through all their so-called scientific data and somehow maybe predict for us the next war or who's going to win the next election or When's the next downturn in the economy? You see, we want such wise men, just like Nebuchadnezzar wanted such wise men, because we fear what the future will bring. And that's Nebuchadnezzar. And so he says, verse 3, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And so far, all seems standard fare. In fact, did you know if you go down to Philly, there at Penn Museum uh, in the uh, ancient artifacts, you can find the Babylonian uh, dream book. Now, it's much earlier than Daniel's time, but it shows you this is what was going on in Daniel's time as well as well before Daniel's time. The Babylonian dream book. It's in cuneiform. Well, you see, the 6th century... 6th century that Daniel's in, Babylon was like the Harvard or Oxford of dream interpretation, predicting the future. So thinking the king is 
asking, following ordinary protocol, his wise men answer, look at verse 4, O king, live forever. They're happy, right? Tell your servants the dream, we'll interpret it. But Nebuchadnezzar isn't following protocol. He breaks it. Remember, the typical practice is the king would say, okay, this is my dream, this is what I dreamed. And then they would go, okay, let's look at our dream book. Uh, Yep, you saw somebody go across a river, okay. And they would interpret the dream. But this time, the king demands the impossible. Four times this is mentioned. Once in verse 5, twice in verse 6, and finally in verse 9. The king demands, in breaking protocol, that they interpret, that they actually tell him what his dream was, and then interpret it. Look at verse 9. Therefore, tell me the dream. I'm not going to disclose it to you. You tell me what I dreamt, and I shall know you can show me its interpretation. In other words, he's saying, are you really wise? Real wise people can actually know the secrets of the heart. And with their backs against the wall, the wise men pitifully plead with the king. Look at verse 10. There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing. The thing the king has asked is too difficult. No one, no one can show it to the king except the gods, and they do not dwell among men. They're not here with us. Do you hear how they hammer the knots? Not a man, not a king. No one can reveal it. Not the gods. They don't dwell with us. But Nebuchadnezzar remains unshaken. He issues his decree. He seals their fate. He orders all be killed. And among the all are Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Let me just stop right there. What's going on? What is God really wanting to show us at this point? Very simple. Where are the wise men of this world? There are none. There are none. God is trying to show the defeat of men's wisdom, the defeat of men's power, the defeat of men's gods. Here we are, remember, Daniel, courtside of one of the most powerful kings in human history. And yet, no matter how secure he looks, how great his power, his fame, his wealth, how large and extensive his empire, no one, none can calm his fearsome, troubled heart. Your money can't buy it. Your armies can't buy it. He has it all, and he has nothing. That's what God wants us to learn. He wants you to know that the kingdom of man ultimately rests on sand. Do not put your trust in man. Do you believe that? You know, fear of the future, fear of loss is so unsettling, isn't it? We all want somehow to safeguard our lives and our loved ones. That's why when somebody takes a trip, we pray for traveling mercies, don't we? How often when something bad happens, do we later turn those events over in our head? We've got to replay them. If, if only I had. If only she, only she had. If only, if only, if only. We've all said it. Did you know that after the assassination of her husband, Nancy Reagan admitted that she turned to astrology? In her memoir, My Turn, the former first lady confessed, I'm scared every time Ronald leaves the house. Here is one of the greatest, most powerful men on earth, and she shares that power with him. 
And she goes to an astrologer because she's scared of the future. She's scared of stepping outside the home. And sadly, instead of turning to God, she turned to an astrologer, not to Jesus Christ. I don't want to pick on her. I want to ask myself. I want to ask you. When you're in fear, whom do you turn to? Whom do you turn to? See, there's lessons here for us. One thing I find is, wow, fear and worry is not a safe sin, is it? Notice what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He gets troubled and fearful. He's worried about the future, and where does that lead him? To frustration and anger and rage and murderous threats. Murderous decrees. Wow. Fear often conceals anger. And anger equally often conceals fear. And what we see in his court, we often see in our own homes, don't we? How often maybe you're fearing over something about your kids or your finances or your health and we respond in frustration, fighting, anger maybe, or we fall into utter despair, helplessness. You see, your fears can turn you away from God. So what do you do? Here's the second lesson. You confess. I see myself in this passage. I am more like Nebuchadnezzar than unlike him. So I say, oh, Lord, forgive me of my sin. And next time when we're fearful, let that fear drive you to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus promises us. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Do not be afraid or terrified. That's God talking to us. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Wow. <laughs> I could stop right there. I love that passage. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, if 1 through 13 records the failure of the wise of this world, what marks a person to be truly wise? What does it mean to be a wise woman? What does it mean to be a wise man? What does it mean to be a wise young man or a wise young woman? Right? Well, look, there are two things I find. Two things that mark a wise person. The wisdom of faith and the wisdom of shared prayer, praying together. Daniel is marked by the wisdom of faith. Remember, Daniel, too, is suffering fear. He's, the threat's been out. The decree, forget the threat, the decree has been passed. Arioch is coming to kill him. Wow. He is under the threat of death. He and his friends, death hangs over him like a dark cloud. And to whom does Daniel turn? Well, it's not to astrologers. It's not to some think tank. He doesn't let his fear plunge him into either rage or despair. What does he do? He takes his fear and it drives him. He lets it drive him to faith in the Lord. Look at verse 14 following. Daniel replies to Arioch with prudence and discretion, wisdom and tact, right? Wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, Ariok, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Ariok explains the matter. And to this, Daniel goes into the king and asks him for time so that he can come back and interpret the dream. <laughs> Did you hear that? I want you to really catch that. He tells the king, give me some time so I can interpret the dream for you. And I'm going, what the heck is he doing? I, it shocks me. How does Daniel know God's going to answer? Right? Uh, 
Is he being presumptuous? Can we lay charge to Daniel? That's a presumptuous man. That's a fool. Is he testing the Lord? That's a great sin to test the Lord. It sure looks like he is. He asked the king for a time that he may know the dream and interpret it for him, and the Lord hasn't even revealed it to him. In fact, God hasn't even promised to do so. So on what grounds did Daniel tell the king, give me some time, right? Is that foolhardiness or faith? Well, it looks like foolishness to begin with. But when you look again, it's right there. He has good grounds to make that claim. First, he knows his God, his wisdom and power. In other words, he knows God can answer a prayer like that because God actually is powerful and all wise, right? Daniel knows God can if he is willing. For God is all wise and all powerful. Secondly, Daniel knows not only that God is all powerful and wise, he knows God is most merciful. Look at verse 18, very important. What does Daniel tell his friends to do? Daniel tells them, seek mercy from the God of heaven. Seek mercy from the God of heaven. And Daniel asks for time not because he presumes God must answer him, but rather he knows God is most merciful. You see, to seek God's mercy is not testing the Lord. To seek God's mercy is not being presumptuous. So for Daniel, maybe the Lord will answer, or maybe not. But he's going to seek God's mercy. He's going to ask, right? And he'll be satisfied with however God answers him. And then the question is, aren't those the same grounds? God's wisdom, power, and mercy? The very grounds that you and I stand upon every time we pray? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's, what we, that's why we can pray. Where the world would, in fear, rage, or despair, we cast our faith upon the Lord, the Lord of power and wisdom, mercy, and life. Do you see what we're being taught here about the wisdom of faith? The wisdom of faith is not primarily knowing what to do, but in whom we are to trust. The wisdom of faith is not knowing what necessarily what to do, but primarily knowing whom you are to trust. Listen, it's baseball season, isn't it? Right? So if um, you're trying to improve your pitching and hitting and Shohei Otani knocks on your door, you open it and he says, I'm here for free, going to spend an afternoon with you, improve your pitching and hitting, would you go, nah, I got this covered. I'm okay. I'm getting better. And if you did, what would your friends say about you? One word, just one word, stupid. (laughs) Right? Stupid. Well, how much more foolish are we when the Lord God, most merciful, wise, good, true, tells us to seek his face. Listen to this. Here's, Here's Christ's promise. Psalm 50, 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer you, and you will honor me. Psalm 50, verse 15. That's another takeaway, right? Call upon me in the day of trouble, Daniel has it in spades, and many times you and I do too. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer you, and you will honor me. That's the first mark, the wisdom of faith. The second is shared prayer. Wise people, wise boys, wise girls, wise men, wise women, when they are in fear, are not only trusting the Lord, they are sharing their prayer request, not just with others, right? But they're getting together. 
Look at what Daniel doesn't. He doesn't act alone. He doesn't try to navigate this treacherous uh, waters of life by himself. Daniel isn't a self-sufficient man. He's a God-dependent man. And what does he do? Verse 18, he tells his friends, right? Not simply pray for him, but to pray with him. When the decree of death goes out, Daniel and his friends just don't hang around and commiserate what a bad deal we're getting. They don't just throw a pity party. What a lousy deal we're getting, right? Their faith leads them to call upon the name of the Lord together. One of the things I love about uh, Lansdale, because we, we did it at our church, is some, and if you're new here, you may every so often see a group of people, and they're huddled, they're talking together, and all of a sudden, they go down. What are they doing? They're praying for one another. Somebody says, how are you doing? Well, this is going on. Let's pray right now. That's wisdom. That is wisdom. When you're confused then, do you get help from others? Do you ask them not just merely to pray for you, but with you? Daniel should instruct us here. So note those two marks, the wisdom of faith and the wisdom of shared prayer. <clears throat> We've seen the futility of the wise of this world. We've seen these two beautiful marks of a wise man. We have one final question to ask. Who is this wise man's God? And the answer is given in verse 20 to 23. It's the theological center of this section. Everything moves to this, these verses. Daniel and his friends give thanks to God for his power and wisdom. Look at verse 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and might are his, or wisdom and power are his. And then following that, he prays with respect to God's power and then his wisdom and power. Look at verse 21. He changes times and season. He removes kings and sets up kings. What's he saying? Nebuchadnezzar cannot lay a finger on me, but God must grant it to him. And we can say, and neither can Putin or Biden or Xi Jinping or you or me. Every movement of my finger is a God-ordained. That's our God. He removes and sets up kings. And he thanks God, I have a God all-powerful. But then he also thanks God for his wisdom. Look at verse 22. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the dark and the light dwells with him. Brothers and sisters, our colleagues at work, our unbelieving friends or family members have no hope in this world. Those who live apart from faith in Jesus Christ are caught in a cul-de-sac of futility. But Daniel knows his Savior. He knows there is no darkness to God. Remember the psalmist, Psalm 139, 12? Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. You may be confused right now in your world what's going on and wondering, are they going to pull through and everything seems dark? But listen, at midnight, God sees it as noonday, right? That's your God. And the third thing, look at verse 23. Daniel takes it, he owns who his God is. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers, you have given me Wisdom. You've given me wisdom and power. That's your God. It's the God who is with you. It's the God who dwells with you. Remember what we recited earlier, right? We have flesh and blood, and what did our God do? He became flesh and blood. Isn't that the very difference between those who follow Christ and those who don't? Remember back Nebuchadnezzar's wise men? Do you remember that pitiful cry they made? Verse 11, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. 
and they do not live among men. Doesn't that cry break your heart? It's the same cry we hear people today. Something bad happens, and people are like, hey, where's, where's God in this, huh? God doesn't dwell with us. That's a lie. And listen, it's a lie from the father of lies. If the devil ever wants to trick you, it's to say God's not with you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he is with you. And he's with you in the most darkest of days. He was with Adam even when he cast them out of the garden. He was with Noah when it was just Noah and his family around a very dark culture, a culture under judgment. He, he was with Joseph when Joseph was in Egyptian prison. He's with Rahab when she's in Jericho. He's with Ruth the Moabitess, right? The alien immigrant, right? Going back to Bethlehem. Dark days. She had lost her husband. Now she's going to go to a foreign land. They're going to treat her like an alien. Right? But she knew God was with you. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you go, I will go. Daniel knew God dwelt also in the tabernacle, in the temple, and he knew the Christ would come and God would dwell with man. Even there, being crucified for us on Calvary. So proclaim the truth of your God. Give thanks to your God. My God dwells with me. Does your God dwell with you? Yes, yes. I was raised on the West Coast, um, Orange County. So I was an L.A. Dodgers fan. And uh, at 10 years old, I remember seeing Sandy Koufax it's long ago, far away. I know that, right? Um, but one guy I really came to, uh, to know was uh, Earl Hersheiser. It was the World Series, 1988. Dodgers against the A's, Oakland A's. And uh, it's the bottom of the ninth. Dodgers are three games ahead of uh, the A's one. So they, they win this game. It's, it's, it's their ticket. And they're counting on Earl Earl Hersheiser, that year, 1988, was a great year for him. He won the Cy Young Award, Golden Gloves, a most valuable player. And just before the ninth inning, not knowing whether he was going to win or lose, he could feel the weight of all the pressure upon him. And truly, all eyes were upon him. I mean, literally, all eyes were upon him. The national television was scanning and would see Earl in the dugout and moving his lips. What was he saying? Well, good news, Dodgers won the game. And with it, the series. And he was invited the next day to be on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And uh, Carson asked him the thing everybody was asking. What were you saying? We saw the camera, but we see your lips moving. What were you saying? And Oral responded, well, um, I wasn't saying anything. Well, what were you doing? Kind of sheepishly, he goes, I, I was singing. <laughs> you were singing? Carson says, I didn't know you were a singer. <laughs> well, what were you singing? Uh, no, you know, it's, you don't, come on, tell us, sing it for us. No, no. But the, the audience started to clap, urged, urged him on. And uh, so he began to sing. He sang the song in the dugout, when he didn't know whether he was going to win or lose, when all the pressure to him of the world seemed to be upon him. And do you know what he's saying? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And he did that for Johnny Carson on national television. And Johnny Carson went, And the audience went silent. You could hear a pin drop. But then one person started to stand and clap. And the whole congregation got up and started to clap. Right. That's a wise man. Nine years earlier, 
Hershiser came to faith in Jesus Christ and wanted to live every day of his life for, for his Lord. So there he was, not knowing whether he's going to win or lose, but he didn't care whether he was going to win or lose. He knew Christ won, and so he gave thanks to God. Amen? That's a wise man singing and giving thanks to a wise man's God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the God who dwells with us. We thank you that you are our God and there is no other. And we thank you that we can even thank you that you've opened our hearts through the regenerating work of your spirit that we could know you truly as forgiven people through Jesus Christ. And in that forgiveness and love, we can thank you. And indeed, we want to. In Jesus' name, amen.